Good evening. Welcome to yet another uh, special presentation by the Nina and Menasha Historical Societies. I'm Jane Lang. I'm the mayor of the city of Nina, though formerly I was the executive director of the Nina Historical Society. At that time, we started this series and uh, look at the founders and settlers of the Nina and Menasha areas. And we're very proud to be able to present yet another um, episode of that series tonight for you. Again, this is our second episode of Founders and Settlers, and we will be discussing tonight the Mansour family and their history. We're very pleased to be able to collaborate with the Menasha Historical Society on this program series, and we'll be continuing the series in the months to come. Again, it's important for us to remember that the first occupants of this land were Native Americans. And this presentation series is in no way meant to diminish the contribution of those people of this area. But this um, series is focusing on European settlement of this area. And so we'll be discussing some of the firsts related to European settlement of this area. And again, this is not in any way meant to minimize the contribution of Native Americans to this area. Before we go any further, I'd like to just draw attention to the fact that the city of Nina is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year, uh, incorporated as a city on March 13th, 1873. So we're celebrating the sesquicentennial this year. Menasha will be celebrating its sesquicentennial next year. So we're very pleased to be working on some wonderful activities and events for this year in the city of Nina and next year in the city of Menasha. Um, there's a wonderful committee who are putting together a lot of activities and events for us. So we hope that you will join us, follow along on the city's Facebook page um, to learn more about those different activities. So again, back to the three uh, of the founding families in Nina and Menasha. We spoke about this in the last um, episode where we talked about the Jordan family, but what we wanted to kind of focus on with the, the founding families of the Nina and Menasha area, there were founders who really were contributing the money and a lot of the power and influence with a focus to develop the area. So those are who we're considering the founders. And um, tonight we'll be focusing on the Mansour family as an example of a settler family in the area. As you can see on this slide, we have a list of some of the different settlers of the area, and we hope to be able to cover some of these. Uh, family stories in the months to come with various presentations on them. One thing I'd really like to point out is the fact that Tom Van Leeshout did a tremendous amount of research to put this uh, particular episode of Founders and Settlers together and we're very indebted to him for all the work that he has done. Again, on this list you can see um, various people who we have identified as being kind of the settler group of people who were instrumental in the early settlement of the Nina and Menasha areas. So tonight we're focusing on George Mansour, who was instrumental in the development of one of our earliest industries and also the startup of a school, which is still functioning today. The settlers' descendants, as we found in researching these different families, are very proud of their heritage. It's particularly exciting when we discover that some of those family members are still living here and still located in the area. It's wonderful for us to be able to connect with them and learn more firsthand information about their family's story. Over the years, the Nina and Menasha Historical Societies have sponsored tours and get-togethers for so many of these descendants of our early settlers. We're very happy to have the descendants of George and Polly Mansour with us tonight. And later this evening, you'll meet Therese Howden-Wright and Eric Howden 
as they present the George Mansour story. So again, um, just taking a quick look back at our first episode on Joseph Jourdain. Um, this was a wonderful presentation that we presented last fall. And uh, that program featured the story of Joseph Jourdain, the first blacksmith in what later became the state of Wisconsin. So a really incredibly important person to our state's history and our community's history. In the first presentation, we covered the process of transferring of the land from the Menominee Nation to the US government. And today we'll be covering the process of the transfer of the US government's Winnebago Rapid Settlement and surrounding areas to the cities of Nina and Menasha. <clears throat> also during our first episode, we discussed how settlers, specifically the Jordan family, interacted with the founders' families to assist in the city's development. Again, you can view our first episode of this on the YouTube channel for Nina Historical Society. Menasha Historical Society also has these YouTube videos available. So please uh, visit those sites, check those videos out. You'll learn a lot and we hope that you'll enjoy them. Not only is it an honor to have George's descendants here to present the story of the Mansur family, but their relatives valued a uh, contribution to our area so much that they have continued to celebrate at many family reunions in the area on the homestead that George purchased in 1844 and within the area at local family homes. Their first reunion in, in 1943 commemorated the 100th anniversary of the grand journey that the Mansour family took from Vermont to the settlement in Nina. 52 descendants gathered for the fourth annual family picnic in 1947. And in 1986, more than 100 descendants representing five generations attended the reunion at the old homestead on Lake Winnebago. I'd like to just also announce that there will be several presenters this evening one will be Kathy Humsky, the Vice President of the Menasha Historical Society. Um, and Menasha historian and President of Menasha Historical Society, Nick Jevney. So at this time, I will turn the program over to Nick Jevney. Thank you, Jane. I would also like to welcome you to our presentation this evening. It's a pleasure to present this series, The Founders and Settlers of Nina and Menasha. Tonight, the main focus will be on one of Nina's earliest settlers, George Mansour. We will discover how he interacted with our founding fathers and the influence he had in the development of our cities. <clears throat> we will start off tonight with the process of how the land was transferred from United States territory to the cities of Nina and Menasha, then focus on George Mansour. We will end with a recap of George's and the Founding Fathers' lasting legacy. In this first section, you will learn who our Founding Fathers were, how they bought the land and built the cities. We will also detail two factors that drew the Founders and the settlers to this area, the Fox River and the Winnebago Rack Rapids Settlement, a community partially built and waiting for occupants. Our story tonight will begin with the War of 1812. On August 16, 1812, American General William Hull surrendered Fort Detroit and his army to the British without a fight. Hull, a 59-year-old veteran of the American Revolution, had lost hope of defending the settlement after seeing a large English and Indian force gathering outside Detroit's walls. Therefore, throughout the war, England was in control of the Northwest Territory, the area from Ohio to Wisconsin. Their hope was to build an Indian barrier state to blunt the Western expansion of settlers. In 1814, with the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, 
The Midwest states again became a U.S. territory, but this time permanently. Wisconsin was part of the Michigan Territory, and Governor Lewis Cass was in control of our area. By 1819, Governor Cass became troubled with the amount of English goods making it into the hands of the Native Americans in his territory. Worried with this alarming trade situation, he wanted to know precisely what was going on in the unexplored area between Michigan and the Mississippi River. Governor Cass took action. This action is explained in detail in Memories of Doty Island. Here is an excerpt from that book. In 1820, the area which is now our state of Wisconsin was a part of the territory of Michigan, but was sought by both England and France. Lewis Cass, territorial governor of Michigan, organized an expedition to explore the lands between Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, and the Mississippi River. He selected a prodigious man of 21 who was serving on Michigan's Supreme Court to be the secretary of the expedition. That young man was James Duane Doty, born in 1799 near the Hudson River in New York. Four large canoes and 14 men, some of them Chippewa Indians, comprised the crew. The voyage started from Detroit and covered the south shore of Lake Superior, the Mississippi and Wisconsin rivers, and the Fox River. The expedition began in May and ended in September in Green Bay. This venture secured what is now Wisconsin and was then a part of the Northwest Territory of Michigan. In July, James Doty and his followers had discovered a 400-acre island between two branches of the Fox River. He was held in awe by the island he encountered as he swung his canoe out of Lake Winnebago and into the Fox. It was beautiful, teeming with wildlife and vegetation. His diary speaks of his profound desire to own that big island and one day make his home on it. James Doty, one of the founding fathers of Nina and Menasha, was the great-grandson of Edward Doty, a passenger on the Mayflower. James studied law and became clerk for both the Supreme Court and the Legislative Council of the Michigan Territory. After this trip, he became a successful land speculator and politician. Doty laid out the military road between Green Bay and Prairie Duchesne in 1835. He also owned land in Fond du Lac County that would later become the Tachita Correctional Institution. At age 23, appointed by President Monroe, he became a federal judge for the territory of Wisconsin. In 1836, he pushed hard to establish Madison as the capital of the Wisconsin Territory. That same year, the island and Menasha were approved for settlement and up for sale. This is the area that Doty had seen 16 years earlier. So he quickly purchased approximately 400 acres of land for $6 an acre. This would include the island that now bears his name, Doty Island. Nine years later, Doty, looking to retire, built the Grand Logrie, we know today as the Doty Cabin, fulfilling his dream noted in the 1820 diary of the expedition. Also in 1836, at the same time Doty was buying property in the future Menasha, the government project at Winnebago Rapids, the future city of Nina, was falling apart. This was a federally funded project established for the Winnebago tribe around the Fox River, currently downtown Nina, east to Riverside Park, and west to Fritzy Park and Fox Crossing. The map on the left is the original design of the project. We covered this project in depth in the Joseph Jordan story. You can see this presentation on our YouTube series. Along the banks of the Fox River, 
the government established a blacksmith shop, sawmill, grist mill, five school houses, and 35 block homes. These were to provide education and teach farming techniques to the Native Americans. The Menominee did not adapt well to this way of life, so the experiment collapsed. With the 1836 Treaty of the Cedars, the Winnebago ceded most of their land in northeastern Wisconsin, including the Winnebago Rapid Settlement to the U.S. government for cash, food, provisions, agricultural supplies, and cattle. As the Native Americans abandoned the village, the Winnebago Rapids buildings were left to settlers, squatters, and any remaining Winnebago. Officially to the U.S. government, the property was deserted. The buildings and block houses will play a critical role in the settling of Nina and Menasha, as the buildings were already built by the government and vacant. Seven years later in 1843, the U.S. government offered up for sale the former Winnebago Rapids settlement by formally placing notices in the newspapers. This caught the eye of another founder of Nina and Menasha, Harrison Reed. Born in 1813 in Massachusetts, moved to Milwaukee where he had a grocery store and a farm. Later he became owner and editor of Milwaukee newspaper, the Milwaukee Sentinel where the Winnebago settlement for sale notice was placed. A political ally and friend of Governor Doty, Harrison called on his friend to inquire into this offer of land. Doty, the current owner of the island on the north bank, the island, advised him it was a great bargain and to put an offer in on the old Winnebago Rapids property. Reed made an offer of $4,760 for the 562 acres. With his offer accepted, Reed owned the structures and all water power of the south outlet, canal, and dam. He did not have the full amount to pay, but a bondsman helped him secure and hold title and property. Terms of the bond were three years at 10%. On October 2, 1843, Reed moved his family from Milwaukee into one of the block homes near the council tree located in Riverside Park. The next year, 1844, he cut a road between Nina and Oshkosh and established the first post office, naming it Nina. In 1846, Harrison brings his publishing trade to Nina and prints the first newspaper, the Nina Conservator. His daughter Nina becomes the first white child to be born in the area. In 1846, Reed's investment was in jeopardy as the balance of the bond was due. Reed, still in debt from past business ventures, needed financing or face losing the land. In July, he connected with a third member of the founders, Colonel Harvey Jones. Harrison sells off half his interests in the investment, except for the farm and blockhouse where Reed leaves to Jones. In turn, Jones agrees to pay the debt to the government. Harvey Jones was born in Johnstown, New York on June 23, 1805. The fourth son of Asia and Lucy Jones, Harvey grew up on his father's farm. When the sons turned of age, their father gave each piece of land to produce crops for profit. Harvey invested wisely, became successful in real estate, and a wealthy business owner of glove manufacturing factory. Now, financially secure, he looked westward for investment and adventure. He was infatuated with the idea of building a town in the west. That is why he made the investment into Winnebago Rapids. Jones brought his family to Nina, living in one of the block homes located now near downtown Nina. Before the move, however, in the spring of 1847, his wife had died so it would be Harvey and his three young children. To make the move even more emotional, his father will pass away a couple months later. By late 1847, friction between Harrison Reed and Colonel Jones began to fracture the relationship. The friction was baked into the process with miscommunication on the original business agreement, Jones' desire to eventually squeeze Reed out, and the fact that they both held the property in undivided shares. The disagreements and arguing between Jones and Reed followed directly on the heels 
of their agreement and went on for several years. Slowing the early growth of Nina, the disagreements were threefold. First, there was a disagreement with the recording of the village plot. Reed called the village Nina, but Jones recorded the village as Winnebago Rapids, creating confusion for the timing of surveying the land. Second, Jones claimed Reed had not fulfilled his agreement on repaying of the loan. The third cause of the rivalry was the placement of a proposed dam and canal. The years between 1849 and 1864 were a dark page in Nina's history, as years of needless litigation made purchasing property a complicated process. As seen in the 1849 announcement posted by Harrison Reed, center right. Meanwhile, Governor Doty and fourth founder Curtis Reed, Harrison's younger brother, decided to develop a rival town north of the river. Curtis secured the building of a dam by putting up 5,000 bonus to the state. The fifth founder, Charles Doty, Governor Doty's son, will become involved in this project. Charles, an accomplished surveyor, real estate agent, was a U.S. military officer and state legislator. He will play an important role in Menashe's development. The Dotys and Curtis Reed found things easier to progress as a village than their neighbor to the south. They laid out the town and recruited Irish labor for the canal construction. With the ongoing difference with Jones, Harrison Reed turned his energy and influence with his brother to help build the community. Now four founders were focused on one mission, develop and grow the area of Menasha, while two founders were slowing the growth of Nina. Menasha's growth was quick. In 1848, water power was started. Curtis Reed built a two-story tavern called Knight's Tavern. Early church services were held here and doubled as a boarding house. This was on Mill and Water Street, where the old Elijah D. Smith Library was located. The first frame building built in the area became a law office. 1849, a sawmill was built by Reed and Northrop, and a post office opened with James Lush as postmaster. The Menasha newspaper, Menasha Advocate, is established. As noted in the upper center, the Pale Factory was established in 1849. This will become the future Menasha Corporation. Local newspapers observed the swift growth in Menasha. Back to Nina. As the Reed and Jones disagreements continued, we will learn about the sixth founder, Loyal Jones, brother of Harvey. Loyal, who lived in Waukesha, left to follow his brother to Nina in 1846. The brothers would share one of the block houses until Harvey brought his family in 1848. Loyal opened the first store in Nina. Lower left is a 1941 photo on 201 East Wisconsin Avenue of the original Yale and Jones building erected in 1848. Loyal also helped develop the first Presbyterian Church of Winnebago Rapids, upper right article, and owned several flour mills. Things were moving forward, but not at the pace of the rival town to the north. On April 6, 1847, the town of Nina and the settlers got together at Loyal Jones' home for an election, lower right article. Some of the items voted on included the approval of the new state of Wisconsin Constitution. As Wisconsin was not a state until the next year, liquor was banned from the village, blacks were given the right to vote, and a tax structure was developed. Also, James Doty was voted the first chairman of the village of Nina. With the Nina Dam and Water Project stalling, and Menasha receiving state backing to proceed in early 1849, Harvey Jones decided to build the canal and locks with his own money. However, only a few months later at age 44, on November 8, 1849, Colonel Harvey Jones died in his home from typhoid fever. He died without a will, so all of his affairs passed to his descendants. This complicated matters as his children were not of age. So brother, Loyal, became in charge of all legal matters, including the dam project, the legal battle with Harrison Reed, and the children's estate. 
This is how the newspapers summarized the years after Harvey's death and the final resolution. Upon the death of Harvey Jones, the entire property was tied up in his estate for years and much litigation followed. The question of title to the lands was in doubt until the children of Jones were all became of age. The development of the village again suffered a setback. Many, many settlers continued to come here but were unable to purchase land and obtain a clear title. They left for other places. Harrison Reed finally sold all of his interests in the property at Nina and moved to Florida. With the final settling of most of the difficulties in the way of the development of the properties, the village took on a more rapid rate of growth. With the water power and the new influx of settlers came the building of the flour mills. For years, the greatest industry here and the leader of the field in the Northwest. The dam and water project was completed by his heirs. In 1856, the two plots that Reed and Jones disagreed upon were consolidated. In the end, Loyal Jones will own or control over 90% of the old Wisconsin Rapids settlement, the future city of Nina. Before we leave the discussion about the development of the two cities, we want to examine what was so important in this area that our founding fathers and settlers would come and stay here. We discussed earlier one of the key factors was that the government already had built structures for the Winnebago settlement. This gave the early inhabitants ready-made shelters. Another significant factor was the Great Fox River. The river's name is the English translation of the French name for the Meswaki in the 17th century. The translated French name is given by explorers Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette because it went through the territory of the Meswaki people called Renards in French. In the Menominee language, the river was known as Red Earth River. This freshwater river uniquely flows to the north, yielding plenty of wildlife and fish. Amazingly, the Fox River has a vertical drop of 164 feet from Menasha to Green Bay. For reference, Horseshoe Falls in Niagara Falls has a similar vertical drop at 167 feet. The current Fox River lock system runs from Lake Winnebago to the waters of Green Bay. In all, there are 17 locks and 12 dams along the 39-mile stretch. Imagine the speed of the river in the 1800s before the dam and lock systems were built. Our founders and settlers knew the importance of the Fox River. The need to harness the power and allow for passages to the Great Lakes could make another Erie Canal. Their focus, with the federal and state's assistance, was to control the Swift River with dams to capture the energy and redirect the power, and canals and locks to allow for transportation and for safe passage. We need to discuss in more detail the significance of the dam and canals to the area and the friction it caused between the two emerging cities. Waterways are a source of life and development for growing communities. At the time, transportation was by either land or waterway. Visionaries could see the commercial significance of the Fox River and the need for it to be tamed in order to maximize its benefits. As early as 1838, James Doty received a promise from the Secretary of War for waterway improvements. An engineer's report projected a cost of $1 million to make the Lower Fox navigable. Eight years later, in 1846, the approval to develop the Fox River waterway was finally received. Being a part of a corporation or partnership improved chances to gain access to government projects on the waterway improvement programs. Therefore, a partnership between James Doty, his son Charles, Harvey Jones, and Curtis and Harrison Reed was formed. The founding fathers in 1846 were of one mind, developed dams at the south outlet and north outlet of Lake Winnebago. In 1847, 
Madison Judge James Doty facilitated the passage of an act within the state legislature to grant him, along with his business partners, the authority to dam the Fox River at each channel around Doty Island. To enhance Doty's efforts, Territorial Council representative and member of the Board of Public Works, Curtis Reed, secured the right to build the dam. In 1848, discourse between partners caused a split in the partnership. The Dodies and Curtis Reed focused on damming the North Channel, Menasha, while Harrison Reed and Harvey Jones accepted damming the South, Nina. Now the two cities would compete for state funding on the project. The disagreement between Reed and Jones created another split, and Harrison Reed began supporting his brother's project to the North. Curtis Reed's $5,000 offer to the state secured the contract for Menasha. Harvey Jones, without the state's financial backing, proceeded to build Nina's Dam and Locks with his own money, estimated to be at a cost of $24,000. In 1849, only seven months after starting the project, Harvey passed away and the project was put on hold. As noted earlier, the legal battle will slow the progress of Nina's waterway project. Here is what the paper said about the progress made in Menasha. At Menasha, Curtis Reed Esquire kindly got up a couple of teams and conned the party to the state works at that point. The canal around the rapids at this place is about three-fourths of a mile in length, extending from the North Branch to Little Lake Butamore. The excessive wet weather has retarded the pr pr prosecution of the work, but it is well advanced, and if the weather admits, the canal will be completed this season except for the locks. There is a substantial dam at the head of the canal, 500 feet long, from which extends a race which is capable of supplying water sufficient to drive all the machinery that can be placed on the bank of the river. Already there are six sawmills, a grist mill, iron foundry, and other machinery and a town of 1,200 inhabitants at this place, the whole of which was unbroken forest two years ago. So, as the two cities were forming, Conflict and disagreements developed between them, affecting their growth and early development during the mid-18th century. These conflicts and disagreements could last for years, or decades, or even centuries. The irony of the dam dispute was that the importance of water transportation would diminish within the next decade. Seeing the handwriting on the wall, Loyal Jones, in an 1856 letter to his nephew, mentioned how he saw the new railroad system could significantly help their flour mills and the property values on the island. By 1861, five years later, the Chicago Northwestern made its way to Nina from Milwaukee through Oshkosh, making a cheaper and more flexible mode of transportation. This will shape the Twin Cities landscape forever. Again, however, this new mode of transportation created friction between the two cities. For more information on these disputes, please see our YouTube video on railroads and depots. We've covered a lot of ground and details over the 36 year span. Before we leave this section, we summarize some of the key dates for your review. The development of the Twin Cities was primarily through three families. This is how the similarities of three founding families was described in the tale of Twin Cities. The founding families, Reed, Doty, and Jones, were all remarkably similar in heritage and personal traits. Alice E. Smith of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin notes that all were of Anglo-Saxon origin, Protestant faith, and middle-class respectability. All were originally from New England. They each had had some measure of formal education and they had built upon that base through individual study and experience. Each was adaptable, versatile, ambitious, and willing to take a chance. Also, each was aggressive, and at times could even be ruthless. Let's take a detailed look at our featured settler, George Mansur. 
We will cover his story in several sections. First, a general biography and the family trip from East Coast to Wisconsin. His early assistance with the founders to restart the idled sawmill and gristmill, which will lead to our area's dominance in state's flour production. Then settling into the homestead on Lake Winnebago. And finally, his significant contribution in the establishment of one of Nina's schools. To present George's story, let me introduce sister and brother, Therese Howden Wright and Eric Howden. Therese and Eric are fifth generation descendants of George Mansour. Our family greatly appreciates the work of Tom Van Lee Schout and the staff of both the Nina Historical Society and the Menasha Historical Society in honoring the remembrance of the Mansur family, early settlers in what is now the city of Nina. Since we live in Milwaukee, what brought us to the Nina Historical Society this year was to donate photos in ornate frames of our ancestors George and Polly Mansur, who came to Nina in 1843. These pictures have been left to my father by his mother many years ago. My father, Michael Howden, and his three siblings are descendants of the George and Polly Manser family via the Sydney Manser line. Sydney was the youngest of the Manser family and was born here in Nina. My father was born in Appleton and graduated from St. Mary's High School in Menasha. His mother was Irene Miriam Manser. She was born in Oshkosh graduated from UW Oshkosh, and lived in Appleton for most of her life. She was a lifelong friend of a cousin from Esther Manser's lineage, Helen Graham, who grew up in Nina, daughter of Hans and Ida Hansen, who lived on North Park Avenue. My father remembers visits there as well as visits to the Graham home at Manser Bay. My brother and I are aware that some people pronounce the Manser name as Mansur, but today we will be using the pronunciation of Manser, which is how our grandmother pronounced the name. George came from a family of pioneers and patriots. The family first emigrated to Massachusetts in 1670. His great-grandfather John served under Colonel Osgood Wright in the French and Indian War. His grandfather William served in the Continental Army under Colonel Reed. George was born on June 20, 1805 in Andover, Vermont. His parents, John and Polly Manser, both from Andover, had eight children. George was their sixth child. George married Polly Smith, also from Andover, in 1829. They had nine children, two who died in childhood. The Mansers were farmers and wanted to move west for a more promising future as farmland on the East Coast was becoming hard to find. In 1843, they set off from the west to find their future homestead. They settled into one of the block houses in the Wisconsin Rapids settlement, becoming the first permanent residence of what would become the city of Nina. From there, they moved to land farmland on Lake Winnebago, as shown in the lower right 1889 photo. While in Nina, George worked with Harrison Reed, growing the new community, including development of one of the first schools in the city. George was a lifelong Democrat and voted in every election he could. It was at the poles that his leg gave way, getting into his buggy. With a cry, his leg buckled and he fell to the ground with an attack of sciatic rheumatism. George failed to recover and passed away at age 91 on July 20th, 1896 at his farm. The story of the family's trip to Nina has been well documented. In the spring of 1843, George and Polly Manser traveled from Vermont to Buffalo, New York by horse and wagon. In Buffalo, they boarded the steamer Black Hawk, owned by the first steamboat captain on the Fox River and Lake Winnebago. Upper left is the route that Black Hawk took through the Great Lakes. Richard Harney, in his book History of Winnebago, provided a detailed account of their voyage. The Mansour family included seven children when the journey began. The oldest was 13. Their eighth child was expected that summer. George was 37 and Polly was 36. They had married in 1829 at Andover, Vermont, the town in which they had both been raised. They left Vermont with the goal of finding a good farm home for their family. Captain Hoddling's 
plan was to run the rapids of the Fox River in order to reach Lake Winnebago with this, his steamer. When they reached Kakana, the paddle wheel was removed and placed on shore. It became the canvas covered home for the family for three weeks. The men then tried and failed to run the rapids with the steamer less the paddle wheel. They then drew the boat onto the shore on rollers and attempted to haul it around the rapids. After progressing three quarters of a mile, that project was abandoned and the boat replaced into the river. It was here at Kakana that Esther was born on July 17th. The Greeno and Law families, settlers near the river, helped the family while, while George and the captain went on to Winnebago Rapids, now known as Nina, to investigate the possibilities as they progressed down the shore of Lake Winnebago. The two men met a Harrison Reed. He was looking for people who would settle and help build Winnebago Rapids into a community. He was successful in convincing George Mansour to settle there. Out of Kokana, the family was transported by a flat bottom Durham boat shown in the lower right. Aided by seven Native Americans pulling and pulling up the rest of the Fox River, they arrived at Winnebago Rapids and moved into one of the block houses on August 9th. 1843. When Harrison Reed purchased the Winnebago settlement, he took ownership of the sawmill and grist mill circled in red. They were on the Fox River near the current downtown. Both the Reed and Mansur households lived in the block houses circled in yellow near the Nina Council Tree in Riverside Park. The mills were in disrepair as they were abandoned for almost a decade. In the early days across America, the land was dotted with grist mills. These water-powered mills were situated ne next to a swift river where the current from that river turned the water wheel, which turned the heavy stones, which ground the corn into cornmeal or the wheat into flour for baking and cooking. The importance of these mills in our area cannot be overstated. Flour and wood were very important industries in these early years. Together, Menasha and Nina became the second largest producers of flour in Wisconsin by 1860, surpassed only by Milwaukee. Here's how the newspapers explain the importance of these Winnebago mills. In the Nina and Menasha area, continual growth, development, and change were taking place. Here, the first grist mill in this part of the country was located, and it was the only one which could run through the winter months, the waters of the Fox River flowing so swiftly that it did not freeze. Grist from as far north as Green Bay and as far south as Fond du Lac was brought here to be ground. Settlers were attracted by the fertile soil of this section and by the pleasant rolling country, which was in such strong contrast to the flat, marshy land at the foot of the lake. Then, too, the splendid water power offered an ideal opportunity for industries, and it was situated on the waterway to Green Bay. Harrison Reed employed Mr. Manser to repair and manage the mills. George quickly set to work restoring the grist and sawmills, getting them back into service. The facilities were up and running in short order. He managed them until 1844. From the book Historic Lake Polygon, lower left in it is a photo of the Jorgensen Brothers Shop, Sawmill and Grist Mill Complex. This is a similar business setup as the one at Winnebago Rapids. Upper right shows an operating flour mill in Menasha from later in the decade. In the spring of 1844, George found the farmland which was the original purpose of the trip westward. On April 10th, George made a claim to the land. At that time, the wild plum trees were in full bloom. The, this abundant fruit, along with the crab apple trees along the shore of the lake, made the land perfect for his future plans. Upper right is the farmhouse flanked by descendants during the 1968 family reunion. In June, the Manser family moved to the family farm between Nina and Oshkosh on Lake Winnebago, circled in red. Underlined in yellow are family members that also bought property in the area. The Mansers had a public house in the front part of the home. Boarders paid no money as bills were paid 
in labor or materials such as cords of wood or harnesses. George would travel to Green Bay with Indian friends to replenish supplies. In 1854, timber from the Manser farm was used in the construction of the lighthouse built in the Menasha Harbor, lower right. The building was 20 by 30 feet, two stories high with gabled ends and a lantern raised above the building on the southeast corner using a white light. Located between Nina and Oshkosh, the Manser family became involved with both communities. The first newspaper published in Oshkosh was The True Democrat. Paper owner James Densmore did his own canvassing for subscribers. George at first declined, but after some hounding, he handed him a half dollar and expressed he wanted the paper to cease after the money ran out because he did not care for Densmore's politics. As time went on, the paper kept coming. George made several attempts to cancel the paper, but it continued to be delivered. George went to the office, and Densmore told him to keep taking the paper or take a licking. He paid no more money, and the paper kept coming. Remember the steamer, the Black Hawk, that brought the family from Buffalo? Well, its engine and boiler were transported to Stockbridge and became part of the new lake steamer, the Manchester. This was to be the first and only steamer servicing ports on Lake Winnebago prior to 1850. Upper right is a later steamer in Oshkosh. On July 4th, 1847, George would be one of the 25 Nina residents on the Manchester's maiden voyage. A band was on board and George joined in with his snare drum. The Lakeview School District was organized in March of 1856 as the school district number three of the town of Nina. The first meeting of the board with 17 in attendance was held at the home of George Manser. A motion for raising $200 for the building of an 18 by 24 foot framed school building with a stove and pipe was approved. The group voted to locate the school on the property owned by Mr. Pope. They also voted to raise $45 to pay for two teachers for six months. Each teacher would work for three months. There were 43 pupils, ages 4 to 20. At the next board meeting, two weeks later, it was decided that the Pope's cornfield property would not work and change the location to the Manser farm, at or as near Lake Road as possible. George leased the quarter of an acre to the school district. In 1859, the school was finally built on the Manser farm and Mary and Cole taught for a four-month school year. The boys sat on one side of the room and the girls on the other with a glowing wood stove in the middle. The subjects were reading, poetry, arithmetic, and drama. George was paid six dollars for her room and board. Janitorial duties were performed by the teacher. In 1862, Mrs. Manser, Sayers, and Walker were responsible for moving the school to the E.S. Pope property, its present-day location. With this timeline slide, we will add a couple of events in black from the Manser's story for your reference. The amazing fact that we found about this series is how the founders and settlers worked together to accomplish their own personal goals. Back in the 1840s, George Manser worked to rebuild the sawmill and lumber mill. These facilities were right next to the blacksmith shop on the Fox River, run by Joseph Jourdain. We covered his story in the first episode. Today, their descendants work together to complete the second episode. On behalf of Tom Van Leesha, it has been a pleasure working with Therese, Eric, and especially their father, Mike. Thank you very much. Tonight, we introduce you to seven different individuals. They lived almost 200 years ago. However, in the year 2023, we still can see evidence of their efforts. Let us take a final look at these individuals and witness part of their later years and final legacy they left on our community. In 1848, Charles Doty served in the first Wisconsin legislature as a Whig member of the Wisconsin State Assembly. Charles was his father's private secretary and served in the United States Army during the Civil War. After the war, Charles took inventory of supplies for the Native Americans and eventually retired to St. Andrews, Florida. His father, James Doty, harassed with bad debts and legal actions, deeded his assets to his son, Charles, 
to protect the extensive real estate holdings. In 1861, James left Wisconsin and never returned. Unsuccessful in an election bid to the U.S. Senate, Doty was appointed Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Territory of Utah by President Lincoln. Later, appointed Territorial Governor, he will die in office at age 66. James and Charles Doty left an everlasting mark on our area that remains today. Most significant is Doty Cabin in Doty Park on Doty Island. Harvey Jones, though his time in Nina was cut short, left a lasting impression on our area. Harvey donated the first five acres of land to start the Oak Hill Cemetery in 1847. The town of Nina bought an additional four acres from Harvey for $40 to complete the deal. Another settler of Nina, Mary Ann Neff, was the first person buried at Oak Hill. She died on September 28, 1847. The city of Nina continues to utilize the project Colonel Jones fought so hard for. In downtown Nina, at the city dam, the plaque on the left commemorates the efforts of several, including Harvey Jones and the history of Nina Water Power Canal. Mr. Mansur got the mills up and running, then settled into the farming life. We have several current landmarks to remember him by. When they began subdividing Mahler Farm in South Nina, the developers wanted to honor the early settlers and included Mansur Drive, pictured top left, as one of the roads. Lakeview School is still standing and educating our children, a testament to the first meeting in George's home. Known for its fishing and sandy beach area, Mansur Bay is located two and a half miles south of Nina. With all of the turmoil with Harvey Jones, Harrison Reed turned back to politics and publishing. He left Wisconsin and never returned. In 1861, Reed moved to Washington, D.C. for a job at the Treasury Department. In 1863, Harrison was appointed by President Abraham Lincoln to be the tax commissioner in Florida to deal with sales and disposition of con confiscated Confederate property. He would become the ninth governor of Florida. Before retiring, he returned to journalism, editing a local magazine, The Semi-Tropical. In Nina, we currently have Green Park. This was the land originally set aside by Harrison Reed to be Nina's Village Green. Called the father of Menasha, Curtis Reed's contribution to Menasha was immense. He is honored with a plaza in downtown Menasha. Curtis will team up with another brother, Judge George Reed of Manitowoc, to establish the Wisconsin Central Railroad out of the Menasha Hotel. <clears throat> Curtis was instrumental in developing a Brighton Beach area. Although the Brighton Beach Hotel no longer exists, there is a section of Menasha that still bears its name. Wow, we took you on a long journey tonight with the history of the beginning of our two cities and the background on our founding fathers to Mr. Mansour, who settled here, worked with our founders, and shaped part of the future that we enjoy today. We'd like to thank you for watching this Founders and Settlers presentation. It's a pleasure bringing Nina and Menasha history to life for you, for your enjoyment and enlightenment. I personally want to thank Nick and Jane, Kathy, and the Mansours for completing this special project. It truly was a labor of love from us. We hope that you enjoyed the series, that we, the stories that we shared. And remember, on our websites, we have this presentation in our YouTube series for you to watch again or to share with friends. Thank you.